Thank you, Rachel. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Pastor Guy is on vacation today, so in his place, we have Pastor Peter Musinski, who will be preaching for us today. Oh, I'll have him say a few words. Thank you very much, and good morning. As good morning. Thank you. Peter Musinski, it is uh, my privilege to be here this morning. So I am a pastor, first and foremost, also a Navy chaplain, and kind of, a, even though it's a reserve, it's a pretty busy Navy job, but when I'm back in Wisconsin, I... I'd love to get out and uh, got a call from the bishop actually this uh, Tuesday. She said, hey, have I got a deal for you? Are you busy this Sunday? And I said, I am not. She said, ever heard of Chetek Lutheran Church? I said, Pastor Guy is one of my oldest friends in the synod. I said, yes, I know Chetek Lutheran. It's been a bit of a different week for them. How'd you like to be a guest preacher this Sunday? I said, sounds like a deal I can't refuse. So it, is a, it truly is a joy to be here, a great time to be the church because that means we seize opportunities that we have to function like a church. And that means certain things with our core foundation of values that come from Christ. So I have my privilege to bring and proclaim some words today. I did not make up the scriptures, but they're kind of apt. We follow a lectionary, which means they've been assigned for generations. And some very good ones that have to do with life storms. So we're talking a little bit about life storms today. And uh, maybe even the next, uh, that, that our interim president, is that the correct title? That's right. Maybe these yeah. next comments will allude to some stormy times. And uh, again, this church is a little bit less pointed at the top, but many of you know the, the nave of the church from the Latin novice or um, ship. You know, that, that is the symbol of us sailing through the seas of time as God's people. And sometimes the seas are calm and there are beautiful mornings like this. And sometimes like the last week, there's lots of rain, a certain amount of wind, and storms that go on, and we still get this privilege of being God's people together. So thank you for welcoming me this morning and for the opportunity to, to proclaim God's good news to you. Hey, I want to start by thanking everybody for coming and being here to worship Christ. So thank you very much. Some of you may not know, but our council resigned, the entire council resigned last Tuesday. So we do have an interim council. I would like to introduce them to you. When I call your name, please just stand up so people just know who you are. So I will be the president. Stu Cochran will be our vice president. He is traveling for work today. The treasurer will be Denny Thrayan. Our secretary will be Jenny Schimmel and Barb Webb, who will be sharing that position. And Mark Limbaum, Howie Moe, and Jim Adams. Thank you all for being willing to serve with me. So just a few things that I wanted to let you guys know right off the bat. It's kind of been a busy couple days, but I will tell you what I know. Um, we will be in place as your interim council until February of 2024, 2025, sorry. At that point, we will elect nine council members. Maybe some of us, maybe not, will run. Um, we will elect three people for a one-year term, three people for a two-year term, and three people for a three-year term. We'll figure that out as we go along. Please feel free to reach out with me to me if you need anything, have any questions, suggestions, I'm open to everything. You can get a hold of me by email, right here in person, call me, whatever it takes. Just find me and we'll talk about it. Um, I will plan to have an agenda. I'm hoping to have it on the big screen during the announcements, and I hope to have it posted here in the church. So you always know what we're gonna be talking about at the council meeting that's coming up. Um, we also have the website up and running, and I am now the administrator of Facebook, along with Marissa Fortin, Katie Bernard, and Stu Cochran will be there eventually. Um, we will be going later today to Dover, I did talk to Pat Nichols out at Dover. We had a great conversation. So Dover is aware of the change. Dover is aware of who our council members are. We also have hired Stephen, Stephen Fortin as our custodian. So you'll see him around the building here and there. Um, we have a group acting as volunteers. So our office will be open Monday through Thursday from 9 to 12. Pastor Guy, Katie, and Kelly all remain as they were before. Um, one thing I will say is if you have an interest in streaming, please let me know. That's probably our biggest thing that we need help with right now. As of today, I'm in. So anybody who wants to help me, feel free. Pastor Guy left a letter that he asked me to read. 
Dear friends in Christ, today my wife and I are celebrating with our daughter Hope 50 years of life, something to celebrate for sure. At the same time, I'm saddened by recent events at Chatech Lutheran, including the resignation of council members and secretary, gifted servants of our Lord who have given much of our life and ministry. I pray for them and our interim council and for our congregation to find healing in the days ahead for the sake of Christ and our mission of making Christ known. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Pastor Guy, I'll hand it back over to you. Well, I think we're actually ready for opening him, correct? But I'll, I'll uh, yeah, we'll say some words of welcome later. I will say this, so uh, Kathy, right? Kathy says be patient with her. She hasn't actually done this process. She's read before, so it's not like she hasn't read, but she hasn't read in this context. I Be patient with me, too, because things will be a little different. I have preached before. I have led worship before, but every place does it a little bit different. So let us, do we stand for the opening hymn? Let's stand and sing together. Praise and thank you. I believe we have welcomed everyone here and given thanks for your presence. Also, those who may be viewing uh, live online or later on a recording, thank you for being a part of this worship service. We do have communion later on in the service. This is one of the essential things that we celebrate is as we begin a service, we acknowledge that though we're created in the very image of God, that doesn't mean that we don't have to take some effort and work at some things, nor that we don't have some uh, areas that need some examination and some reformation. So as a reformation church, we're going to begin with that acknowledgement with our confession of sins. We do so in the presence of God and of one another. For those who care to follow in the hymnal, page 94 in the beginning part. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done, things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, 
cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And let us pause before we go on to the prayer of the day. A chance for your own self-examination, your confession, your um, emptying of yourself before God as we gather together as fully as possible, as mindfully as we can of this time that we have together as God's people to worship, to sing, to pray, to hear God's word, to listen for the spirit. And it's my privilege as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ by Christ's authority, only by his authority, I declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue in prayer. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us, and by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We sing together, my life flows on in endless song.
they can hear you now, they can hear you now. Here you go, like this one. Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3, 23 through 32. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let them that God redeem them from the hand of the foe, gathering them in front in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships plying their trade in deep waters. They beheld the works of the Lord, God's wonderful works in the deep. Then God spoke, and a stormy wind arose, which tossed high the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heavens and descended to the depths. Their souls melted away in their peril. They staggered and reeled like drunkards, and all their skill was of no avail. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You stilled the storm to a whisper and silenced the waves of the sea. Then they were glad when it grew calm, when you guided them to the harbor they desired. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them exalt you in the assembly of the people in the council of the elders, let them sing hallelujah. Second reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and I'm a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown, and yet as well known, as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. When evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of our Lord. 
Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God who is, and who was, and who is to come. Amen. This is a season of anniversaries, a high amount of milestones, some we might call kind of crucible events that shape us, that send us in a new direction. Everything from graduations to weddings, anniversary ordinations or anniversaries of ordinations, my 34th is coming this next week. There are degrees, like degrees conferred at schools, and there are decrees from adoption decrees to divorce decrees. Not all these milestones are happy, are they? Pastor Guy reminded me that 17 years ago, the Bishop Berg Bebop Band performed, and he and I were both members of that band that played a couple places around the Synod that many years ago. We're one year out since a rather powerful event took place. You might have experienced it. We definitely did at our farm here southeast of Rice Lake. If you put that first slide up, please. This is a clue. Um, yeah, there was a bad storm then, about going on just about a year ago. This is one of the four windows that had glass broken. And we may actually have everything in a state of new normal by the 19th of July this year. In fact, this window was replaced last week. We got the right one. So we're just waiting on a couple that they put in, but they're not exactly the windows we ordered. So we may get this resolved at the one year anniversary, which would be an awesome thing. As you recall, using a different term, it was an awesome storm of hail and wind, of shattered glass and ruined roofs and downed trees. You may have missed that storm or it may have missed you, but I wonder if you experienced anything being shattered or broken. If not a fragile sheet of glass, perhaps a sensitive side of your soul or psyche. As we at our house post hailstorm are still waiting for the right replacement window. Sometimes we're waiting for a contractor to show up. We're wondering what is the cost going to be and when will we see any sign of progress? So how has your spirit been this summer? Has anyone here experienced, I don't know, a break, a breach, a bruise? When it comes to homes or churches or congregations or relationships or our lives, who's working on the repairs and what's the best possible outcome? It wasn't only windows and siding that was damaged. If you go to the next slide, this is our front yard looking one way. We did have one smaller tree and part of a driveway, it got a third of a mile driveway, so there's a good chance something's gonna be down the road of it. We also had three large basswoods trees that fell, thankfully, relatively harmlessly back in a hay field. As we cut and cleaned those up, whole family was home. All three children, they live in different places. They're pretty much grown up. They were home and one daughter found a dead woodpecker. Clearly one of these hailstones had hit it. We had some almost the size of tennis balls. I didn't include that slide because this is old news to you. There's various sources of the blows and we suffer different degrees of damage. And the manner in which we respond to these is also often different. This generation's most deadly combat mission, which I was a part of in Iraq, showed me something experienced not just in past wars by things that were seen or things that were done, but in the forms of harm that are inflicted and received in what should be safer settings like families like organizations or congregations. I am aware of some of the pain that this congregation is experiencing. In some ways, unique to Shatek Lutheran. In other ways, kind of sadly common to other congregations of the ELCA, to other Christian gatherings, to those kind of religions that are not a part of the Abrahamic faith. You know, so beyond Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, there are groups that get together and people being people, harm happens. There's injuries. In battle context, we speak of the trauma as being moral injury or soul wound. Sometimes there are literal burns and bruises and body bags, what we call human remains pouches. I can testify to that personally. And other times our experience of disappointment or discouragement that surrounds our actions is something that's a sense of 
offending our Christian values, which are a good thing, means we've been paying attention to Christ. And when somehow we've come to places of disappointment and disgust, of breakage and bruises, our first reaction may be quite right to say, there's something about this that hurts. And there's also some danger in the first reaction being what we talk about is a more basic function of our brain, that is to get us out of this safely, the kind of freeze or fight or flight phenomenon. But there's no question that disappointment can surround us in even decisions that may be necessary or practical or, and, and yet are nearly impossible to enact with grace or care or compassion or are impossible for some to receive those with the best intention of how those decisions have been made. Yes, that we're concerned about hurt feelings and misunderstandings can be even Christ-like. Could be part of what it means to be created in the image of God. As a species, there are some things unique about us. And a sensitivity of harm to others is one of those, for sure. But when accusations and suspicions drop in, and when disagreements spiral into designated another person as evil and as an enemy, well, those are deep bruises. Those are breaches and breakages. And we start to wonder, is anyone working on the repairs for this? And is there any good outcome possible? I discovered, I guess, maybe you didn't discover, but kind of emphasized in country in Iraq and in congregations as a settled pastor at a number of churches, a regularly called pastor as an interim at a handful of other churches, that these in some ways are completely normal reactions. They've got our species some success over the eons of time. We've responded in ways that get us through the moment, but there's also a temptation to respond in what we call in the military friendly fire. Friendly fire. It's particularly poignant in an asymmetrical war like the global war on terror, where there are fewer face-to-face -face fire flights like my dad was in in World War II where you actually see the person who's intending to do you harm. In Iraq, there was more often casualties inflicted with what had been invisible IEDs, improvised explosive devices, so that when we had members of my unit that were killed in action, we could not really respond immediately to those that were the perpetrators of it. They weren't seen. So in cases like that, what's the temptation? The temptation is to respond to those who are near to us, be they the commanding officer, that's our commanding officer who just wants to get through the mission surviving it. Could be actually on the chaplain, or in the cases of our civilian kinds of conflicts, it could be the clergy. Could be this or that committee, or choir, or church council. Or if we want to just make sure we can find someone to blame, we might move it up a level, just not too far from here, right? Is that synod, synod of ours? I serve on the synod council, and sometimes it's good to say, well, you know, if they would just have solved this thing for us, or let's take it up another level. How about the church-wide? We will never see them at Chicago, but it's easier to point our fingers, which substitutes for the hard work of understanding the circumstances and finding the best possible outcome for our relationships, for our church, in fact, for our faith and our understanding of who God is, what God's promises or faithfulness to us is, and what our responsibility is. There's another way of asking the question of, can we work for the repairs? Are we the ones responsible in any way? And what is the best possible outcome? Well, when it comes to storms, God knows a thing or two about them. In fact, scripture today, the assigned lectionaries for this day, and actually the one I omitted is a long reading from Job, a man who you know, a parable, if you will, of what it means to experience suffering, particularly someone who is very good and faithful. Not perfect, but good old Job suffers sorely, awful destruction, including some violent storms in the literal sense. But we also know these storms are understood in the more than literal way. That's the way we read the Bible in our tradition. Things are not always only meant to be literal, though real storms happen and cause real destruction. Not yet. But anyway, the scripture today talks about giving thanks to the Lord for God is good and then gathers people together from the east and the west. Some go down to the sea in ships. They ply their trade in the waters. They behold the works of the Lord is in the sea. Amazing, powerful thing. But then God spoke. This is one approach. And it's different in our New Testament. But in this case, it's God speaking, and a stormy wind arises. 
It tossed high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens. They descended to the depths. Their souls melted away at their peril. You might call that a soul wound, a bit of a moral injury. We're at sea, and, and back then, of course, they thought, God is even behind this? What have we done? What's God up to here causing this? They staggered and reeled like drunkards, only they didn't have the benefit of some intoxicating substances. They're just getting seasick out there. And all their skill was to no avail. Then, this then is important for us, then they cried out to the Lord, and God delivered them from their distress. You stilled the storm to a whisper and silenced the waves of the sea. In our New Testament lesson, there's kind of a morally neutral storm. It's not like God caused it. In fact, somehow Christ is this super non-anxious presence sleeping in the boat in the middle of a storm, going out to sea, the winds whip up, and the disciples are like, what is going on? We're about to get swamped here. And oh my gosh, Jesus is sleeping there. So they wake him up. And he, of course, calms that storm as well. However we look at the source, whatever role some of us have in those, there's no question that these are powerful things and it reveals to us the awesome power of God. And guess what? The Bible says we were created in God's image. So we're pretty awesome as well. We God's people. And we know as a church, in collective ways, we've got some wonderful things in our history. Not just the literal first use of firepower, but the spirit-fired power that gives us the capacity to prioritize things in our world to further this good and gracious will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's inspired people of faith across the ages, individually for personal redemption and publicly for peace and reconciliation. In scriptures, the storms are an example of deadly force although maybe not inherently evil or good, but do leave a consequence of potential harm. And it's something God can silence, even solve. In the end, in the biblical examples from today, ultimately, God ensures the safety of the sailors. And in our figurative sense, from modern national wars to multi-perspective problems in congregations, Again, thanks to this amazing brain to multiple solutions sometimes leave us saying we could have done something different, but also give us capacity in the midst of those to come out with creative solutions, which also, I think, reflect this very image of God as those who are awesome. So while God is solely awesome, and we are that, Luther talked about something he called simul justus et peccator. It's one of, I think, his good insights. It's related to what I'm going to say about our human nature. He says we're both saints and sinners. At the same time, that's kind of that conflict in us. And, and sometimes the saintly side rears up, and sometimes the sinnerly side is a little bit more obvious. So we are awesome, created in the image of God. And you might say that we're also flawed, or as I like to say, we're flossom. We are flossom people who have that within us. So when we look at problems, be they global political and all the means of statecraft and solving them, or being in a combat zone where, you know what? You didn't have anything to do with my death. Someone else, I volunteered, okay? It's a volunteer force, so there's a point, just like a congregation, what do you know? It's voluntary organizations in our country, no mandates. We are moved by the Spirit to be a part of worshiping communities in order to understand the goodness of God and to grow in our faith which is our ethical foundation for all that we do and all that we say and all the ways that we act and live out that life. And yet we are not strictly awesome, we're flossom. And in these seasons of storms and seasons of anxiety and animosity, you know, sometimes that fight or flight brain takes over and despite the awesome capacity that we have, we go back to that basic level. We find it hard to imagine a new normal, something more positive. Next month, I'll have another anniversary, 24 years. 24 years ago, I thought my Navy career is over. In fact, someone told me that when I went into surgery. It was a last resort. Everyone said, don't do that, get physical therapy. I did, just got worse. And so we had just moved to Marshfield, and, and eventually I went into the Marshfield Clinic, and a wonderful neurosurgeon named Dr. Sanjay Rao made me better and gave me that lower back surgery, and I was not, indeed, released from the Navy and didn't even miss a physical fitness cycle, just a good recovery, a healing. Uh, do I still need to do things for it? Did I have some rehab and some involvement at the time? Yes. 
Am I still very conscious of exercising my core and my back to make it work? Absolutely. And it has got me another, let's see if that's 24 years ago, it's got me uh, 10 more years, or 24, 24 more years of being in the Navy and having an opportunity to minister in that way. It's a new kind of normal that I couldn't have expected. And going under the surgeon's knife is one of those, we could say, painful things, though. I was out, and as soon as I came out of the surgery, I'm like, oh my goodness, that pain that was there going through my sciatic nerve, it's gone. It's like a mini miracle. Those downed trees from our backfield, well, those summer and fall trees got everyone together, did the wood cutting and splitting, and they warmed our house in spring. There was something that was utilized, some opportunity that was given to us to uh, bring the family together for a bonding experience. Don't the children love that? Let's do something together as a family. Yes, it brought us together to do that, and it provides a source of warmth and heat and goodness. Now, I am a better woodcutter than I am a gardener, but finally we moved back to, to Wisconsin, to the, basically the place I grew up at. Moved back four years ago. And I'm just not the green thumb that, say, one of my brothers is. But I said, you know what? And he was moving, he had a bunch of bulbs from uh, lilies and gladiolas and dahlias, and he had given to us maybe before. I said, you know what? I'll put those in the ground. How hard can this be? And they were, they were flourishing, they were thriving. There's this big bushy green plants coming up. And then, well, we talked about the storm, right? Now then there's these thin little spits of grass-like stuff that are sticking up there. That's, that's all that's left of those things. And uh, you know what, though? Over millions of years, there's something in the DNA of creation that has a powerful resilience to it, that can bounce back, that can take a hit and, you know, come back, that can, that can experience a devastating Hailstorm. In fact, the neighbors, we saw nine or so people out in the field. One of our friends said, oh, they had all the adjusters out there because he said, this is what 100% damage looks like on a soybean field. There were those little stems and sticks up there as well. And in ours, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm awful at this. I had this stuff growing, but done. Pelted, pummeled by hail, nothing left but a fill, few thin spears. And now you can see, though, what happened in the illumination of the light. Given a few months in October, this is what happened, and there was actually a flower or two, beautiful, precious, powerful examples of life revealed by the light of Christ. Now, like I said, time is not magic. It doesn't heal all things if we ignore them. In most cases with us as humans, it requires our participation in it. It requires us to do the kind of the PT the exercises that maintain it. It might require us to have some more um, uncomfortable conversations and difficult gatherings before we find a way forward by the grace and insight of God. But being created in the image of God means we can do more than what these flowers do, which is survive. We can thrive. Yes, we have flaws. There's some flaw with the awe in us, in our church, in this congregation, I'm sure, somewhere along the line. Christ's church has survived our best and our worst efforts of transmitting the good news. It's not the time to abandon what we know, what we've heard over the generations. I expect some of you have been here for more than a year, a little bit longer in your life, and I'm positive, especially like I said, knowing Pastor Guy, that you've heard something of the grace God has applied to us and the invitation to do in a flossom way, but to stick to it, to do as Christ has taught us. Um, as a chaplain of the Navy, I've served Marines for the first eight years of my career, and part of their song talks about first to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. You know, if Marines can be the first to fight for things like honor, I would think that we in the church have that capability within us to fight for things that we may not want to hear, because what Jesus said, forgive, twice I think it was, right? Or we should forgive two times and then stop? I don't think so. I think it's an ongoing process. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself, but then how about that neighbor? Surely you don't mean those that I have perceived to be an enemy or in opposition to me. They're actually evil, aren't they? Well, what if they are? And they aren't, by the way. They're flossom like you. But even if they were, Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We know this. This is, this is not PhD level Christianity. This is pretty basic stuff loving neighbors as we love ourselves, forgiving repeated times, 
extending grace towards others. And guess what? Well, we're working in this with Christ. So when we had that storm, the first call the next morning was to our insurance company. The second call was to try to get a contractor. And guess what? They're busy because they've got projects already. And apparently, a lot of people beat us to it because we didn't get the contractor we wanted. So we settled for another one. What do we call the one that's over everything, the contractor? Usually a general contractor. But, uh, and we'll say that with the first one because he didn't last so long. But the second one is someone. Now we're getting the work done because when we called him last fall, he's like, yeah, we can't get it done this year. We're too busy. We're like, well, we're going to get someone else. We did that. Didn't work out so well. So I'll say this year, though, we went back to what I'll call the admiral contractor, the good one. We've got the admiral contractor on the job. And yes, he subcontracts some of the work to others. Different people do different specializations in it. And this is how it works for us. We have an admiral contractor. It's called Jesus Christ. There's someone who's the head and subcontracts the opportunities to us to do the good things that need to be doing and done in this world. When we pray repeatedly, and we'll do it today, your kingdom come on earth, we're committing ourselves to be subcontractors that will do it in our professions, in our households, in the way that our religiously informed policy decisions allow us to vote in an election year, and the things that we do with volunteering with our time, all of our actions are inspired and informed by our admiral contractor. This God who says to us, yes, you're created in the image of God, in my very image, and yes, you can't quite get it right because you're not God. You're still flossing people. But I have raised you up in a church that confesses a belief in the power of resurrection, is one that can imagine new futures that are full of hope, that are illuminated by the Christ light, which could be our mantra. When we find that that lower basic brain is functioning, the amygdala, we need to breathe in slowly and exhale even more slowly. And maybe we can say to ourselves, Christ, be our light. Christ, be our light. Shine in our church gathered today and shine in us when we go from this place to love and serve the Lord. So I invite uh, our musician to come forward. That is our hymn of the day. It's called Christ, Be Our Light. And I'm going to bring out the uh, Bishop Bob Berg Bebop Band, alto saxophone, to play along. Thank you for singing using this voice, because one of the powerful things that we get to do as a church, this kind of get back to basic biology, is hum together if you don't know the words, or sing together. It actually stimulates this longest nerve in our body, the vagus nerve, which is a positive thing, which gives us a resiliency. So keep on gathering, keep on singing, and keep on with that mantra, Christ to be our light. Shine in this church, gather today, and wherever we go to serve Christ. Amen.
three verses. That's okay. Round it up. stand for our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He is set to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us uh, pause for a time of prayer. We come before God with our concerns, our needs, our cares, our praises, and let us begin with that. Oh God, we give you praise for the gift of this day, for the opportunity to gather as your people here and around your earth. We thank you for the beauty of creation. We uh, appreciate just the right amount of favorable rainfall and give thanks for those uh, grounds that have received this rain. And remember those who have been afflicted by excessive rain in various areas our beloved um, sisters in Christ, your children of God, whoever they may be, wherever they may be. Thank you for this occasion for uh, Pastor Guy that he can celebrate such a milestone with his daughter and his family and have this brief period of, of renewal and readiness for the, the mission that lies ahead of him as, as one of your servants, as the, one among all of us, as the priesthood of all believers who has our role as subcontractors in the work that you've called us to do. Here are prayers for uh, the, the interim counselor, interim, interim counselor, that a council that has stepped in, and for inspiration that they need to uh, face the coming days and to seize this opportunity in the best possible way with the entire participation of your body of Christ here at Chatech Lutheran. Oh God, we name before you in our hearts those with particular concerns of body, mind, or spirit those who may be suffering from soul wounds or moral injury or uh, mental health crises, those who are facing physical needs and surgeries and may be scared and anxious about what this could mean and the side effects that they sign off on, but we pray that there is an awareness of your presence, that your holy ones are with them and guiding surgeons and anesthetists, all those called to the healing arts, guiding counselors and caregivers with both the VA and organizations that deal with those who have come through combat and, and still suffer from that, and those counselors who deal with all those who suffer from the worst that, that uh, families sometimes could del deliver to them or circumstances uh, and give a renewed sense of hope in life. Again, utilizing all of us as we have our role as those who are subcontractors with you in this work of the kingdom. For the privilege of serving you this day, I give you thanks, and for the, this beloved congregation of people, these uh, who are dear to me as well, I praise you, and uh, pray for them, and we'll continue to carry that on. This is my commitment, and this is the calling that we all have with the body of Christ that goes well beyond this congregation, well beyond even our synod, our denomination, and well beyond our own faith tradition, for all people have been created by you. You are a good, gracious, awesome God who creates all things and, and over the eons has encoded within each of us an amazing power and with groups of us collected together the multiplication of that power for goodness and for hope and for life. So pour that spirit upon all your people, wherever they may be, with whatever name that they call you by, so that your work may indeed be furthered and your gracious will done on earth as in heaven. All these things 
whatever else that you see that we have needs, we commend to you and to your hands through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now, is there other plates passed? Yes, they are. There they are. So at this time, we receive our offerings. One of the ways we exercise our faith, we respond, is through generosity. So please, generous, and uh, thank you for sharing the gifts of music with us this morning. this gift of God for God's people. On that same night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And as Christ has taught us, we gather together as our people have over the centuries to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Christ has invited us all to this table. I am not at all sure what the procedure is here, so I'll wait for someone to assist me, and I'm happy to participate in that and, and serve you the bread and wine. So, but thank you for your communion assistance. I'm sure you can get some cues from the ushers, and unless you're visitors today or guests, which you're certainly welcome. You know, follow, follow what others are doing around you and know that you are absolutely welcome at this table of Christ.
Receive this benediction. May the body and blood and blessing of our precious and risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Are there additional announcements? Kind of, kind of got some highlights there. Didn't you, Gloria? Okay. Or something light, stormy lights, opportunity lights. Yes? We have an announcement. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Tony Cochran, if you remember me, um, but just wanted a reminder that there are prayer requests. These are the blue sheets that you see, and we have a small group of prayer warriors that would love to pray for you, so you just have to fill this out, and um, there's a basket in the back, and you just slip it in there, and we would love to pray for you, so just wanted to remind you of that. And anybody to the chosen, Hallmark has a birth for you, Jesus. How uh, did you get that? The Chosen? Oh, the new season? Yeah, well, okay. the first three seasons. All right, there you go. First three seasons, The Chosen. Getting a good, uh, good, provocative yeah. perspective on uh, part yeah. of our tradition. Yeah. For your first week, Downing Thomas. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, anything else? I think I get a final benediction. And for that, I, I like to use something that engages the reality of what all of us are called to do as Christians. And like I said, uh, humming or singing, if you don't know this, you won't know this verse to the song. The, this tune itself might be familiar, so I invite you to at least hum along. It is, it would, we call it Eternal Father. In the Navy, we call it the Navy Hymn. There's a number of verses, so I went to Iraq with CBs. Those are construction battalions or builders and engineers. And so I will get to see me in this closing verse and think of us as who we are. We're community builders. We are Christ builders. This is our role. This is our calling. This is our contracting that we have accepted to do in this all-volunteer force. We call it the Christian Church and an all-volunteer force here in the United States. No one's requiring it. And so we have this rich religious tradition that we are a part of and we practice and exercise our faith. So hear yourself in the words of this CV verse of Eternal Father. And like I said, feel free to hum along. And, and receive this blessing of God. Lord, stand beside all those who build and give us courage, strength, and skill. Lord, give us peace of heart and mind and comfort loved ones left behind. Lord, hear our prayer for CVs, where'er they be on land or sea. Amen. And so Christian builders, community of builders, after we sing this song, we're going to go in peace to love and serve the Lord and build this kingdom for Christ. Amen. Stand, let us stand and sing together.
Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord, therefore encourage each other. Yes, okay, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.